So, our next speaker is Dr. Tracy Perrone, and I wanted a veterinarian, Dr. Perrone's veterinarian, to have a monthly article in bee culture from a veterinarian's perspective, because we have the VFD, Veterinary Food Directive now, and other things about that, and, and from her college's experience, as she's a, a professor there as well. You know, this has been really kind of weird for me, because it's a different kind of I'm a professor, so yesterday should have been giving a talk on the anatomy of the spinal cord to my students. That talk is still available if anybody cares to hear that. But, you know, I give talks usually on something scientific, beekeepers or veterinarians, and something, you know, on a certain topic. But I haven't had the opportunity to talk about myself. So that's, thanks, Jerry, for offering this kind of thing. It, it, it's been interesting to hear all the women in here talking about this. You know, and, and I'm really like humbled and I feel so empathetic towards many of the women that are here. You know, that we've had all these kind of interesting journeys and kind of weird things that have happened, you know, to you in your careers as it kind of came along, that things you weren't expecting. Like everybody was like, you knew exactly what you were going to do when you first graduated from high school or college or whatever. Completely different thing. So that's been really interesting to hear about how all of these, you know, twists and turns that occurred that you never thought were going to happen, happen to you. Christians call that divine appointments. So, you know, whatever you want to think of how that happened, to you, it's, it's awesome. Um, I've also noticed that a, a lot of us have stories about people that maybe put us down or underestimated us, right? We joke and laugh and make fun of men. And, and that's okay. There's going to be men that disrespect you, put you down. And probably most women have stories or even abuse you. And I think younger women put up with it. But I'm at a point where I'm an old woman, and I don't put up with it anymore. You know, I just don't waste time. You know, I've learned. Because what I also know is that the good guys, I like a lot. So I think men that have helped us along the way deserve a lot of credit. So, yay, guys. Okay? And also, I think women need to support women. You know, so this is awesome that we have that opportunity to do this. Because sometimes women don't always support women. But I think women do. And mentor women. So thanks for this opportunity. So, yeah, this is going to be from a veterinary perspective and how I was trained. You know, I'm a clinician, I'm a doctor. So I think of things from like an exam and a diagnosis, a treatment plan type of thing. But I'm a clinician that became an academic, which is kind of a weird thing to do. But you'll notice I have this now what thinking in my title. And now what is meant to address you ever have like this great idea where a lot of people have these great ideas and the great idea sounds great at the beginning, but you have to think past, okay, if I implement that idea, what else is going to happen? And sometimes if you don't think of the big picture, you get sequelae that happen that affect other aspects of everything else that's going on that might be not what you expect might be negative things. So you'll notice I have this in honeybee and public health. Public health is the reason why I'm here. I actually didn't get into this because of honeybees, at least not initially. I got into this because I'm very interested in public health. And veterinarians, we actually take an oath. Maybe you guys have a relationship with a veterinarian and you go and you take your dog and they get vaccines and that's what you think veterinarians are. But that's a really small part of what veterinarians are. Veterinarians are trained in public health. I took an oath to protect the public health, which means animals, yes, but it means all of you in here too. So that's why I got into this. I should mention, yes, I'm a doctor of veterinary medicine. Yes, I'm still licensed in the state of Pennsylvania. That's where Grove City College is. It's about two-ish hours from here. So I am a professor there in biology, but I'm not a PhD. I'm a DVM, just doctor of veterinary medicine. So a little bit about my backstory. I'm a Somerset County gal. Somerset County is a rural county in Pennsylvania. It's a very rural county. So I grew up with cows and horses, right? And I grew up in the woods and I grew up, you know, finding frogs and salamanders and snakes and things out in the woods. So that, that's kind of my background. So I was always interested in animals. And I had somebody ask me the other day, you know, 
is you want to be a veterinarian. That's really popular, right? Like you ask any little five-year-old little girl, she's like, I want to be a veterinarian, right? But I didn't really know it actually until I was in college. I actually wanted to be a marine biologist and be Jacques Cousteau and save the world. And most of you guys have said that, you know, and when you're in your 20s, right, you think you can save the world. Well, but I got to college, and I was a biology major, and I went to St. Vincent College, which nobody knows about. So if you are a Steeler fan, you know where St. Vincent is, because that's where the training camp is. But I did my biology major there, and I actually did an undergraduate research thesis there, which is actually kind of unusual for undergraduates. And I did it in dairy cattle, uh, hoof and leg disease in dairy cattle, and how they pasture time related to that. So that was my undergraduate. And then I went to OSU. And there's lots of people that have relationships here, right? Like the Ohio State, the Ohio State is how you're supposed to say it, right? And that's where I got my DVM. And at that point in my life, I thought, that I was going to work in clinical practice for us. My goal was to be a veterinarian and own my own practice. That's what I thought I was going to do. I graduated and I thought I'd know everything about veterinary medicine. I didn't. <laughs> they just gave me a degree and said, go. So I did. Now I'm going to tell you how old I am. I worked in veterinary clinics from the time I was 18. I actually worked as a veterinary technician from the time I was 18 all the way through undergraduate vet school and things. So technically I've been working in veterinary medicine for 31 years. You can do the math. For 16 of those years, I worked in some sort of clinical setting. My background again is a large animal with dairy cattle and horses. I did some small animal as well. I worked in clinics that were very rural. And I worked in clinics that were in a town very similar to this, a cute little square. I worked in a corporate practice. So I worked at different kinds of clinical practices. And at one day, I had a, a very interesting appointment uh, where I had a, a client come in. And she looked at me and she said, you know, you would be a really good teacher. OK, sure. And she invited me to a veterinary technician college or a technical trade school where they had assistance for different medical professions, dental assistants, medical assistants, veterinary assistants. And she said, why don't you come down? And I thought I was going to give a guest lecture on like heartworm disease or something. And it turned into a job interview, which turned into a part-time job, which turned into a full-time job in like a week. That kind of led to becoming a medical director of a USDA research and teaching facility. A couple years. So, you know, you never really know how those opportunities are going to run into your career and how it's going to change things. So I ended up teaching and directing a research facility. That's kind of a longer story, but it, it kind of got me from a clinical setting more into a teaching and research center, which I never really expected to do. You know, and, and along the way, you know, we talked about some of you guys have talked about, you guys have talked about some of the issues that you've had. When I first got out here and I thought I was going to, after one year out in clinical practice, I actually had a contract to buy a practice. And my husband and I, we sold our house and we moved. And I got there and we had financials, all of its contracts up, and the guy told me he can't sell the practice to me. And I had no job, and I had no house. I had to figure out what to do. You know, and again, it's those things that seem like it's a big failure. Right? So, you know, that led me to small animal practice in Beaver, Pennsylvania, which looks a lot like Medina, Ohio. And that's where I met the client that sent me to the school that I became a medical director. I, I never ever thought I was going to be a teacher. But I started teaching like, literally three years, four years out of school. So I was in that medical director position for six, seven years. 
And then I had my son. And, you know, family sometimes changes things for women. And it certainly changed for me. And, and it wasn't just having my son, but when he was born, he had some health issues. And I decided that I needed to stay home a bit more. So that was a very big job. Being a medical director of a research and teaching facility in downtown Pittsburgh was kind of a big thing. Driving every day. So I decided to go part-time. And at that point in time, I could. That was like 2007, 2008. When I got out of veterinary school in 1999, being a woman, if you didn't want to work full time in veterinary medicine, you couldn't. You were considered a slacker if you went part time. You had to work full time. And by the way, working full time in veterinary medicine is like 50, 60 hours a week, and you're on call. But by the time I was done with my medical director position, it was kind of okay to work part-time. That started to happen because women have pretty much taken over the industry. So that allowed me to raise my son, spend some time with him, and still work part-time in clinical practice. But I had gotten the bug to teach while I was in this position. So I took some adjunct positions. Penn State, Geneva College, local colleges around. It was a Penn State fever branch campus where I taught anatomy, where I taught cell biology. So my son is doing great now. He's a senior in high school. And he's fine. But about the time he was five, he was doing pretty good. And I wanted to go back to work full time. But I did want to go back to clinical practice, which was weird to me. So that's what I thought I always wanted to do. And I ended up getting a job at Grove City College. How this happened was kind of miraculous, too. I was actually applying for jobs. And applying for university positions is not very easy, especially when you don't have a PhD. And I was actually applying to Slippery Rock University for a job position. there. And while I was interviewing, when these interviews are you know, day-long interviews, two faculty members, so biology faculty, pulled me aside and said, they're looking for someone like you at Grove City College. Which is weird, because when you're applying for a job at a certain position and the faculty members go, Psst. you know, and not just one, but like two, you know, took the second hit over the head for me to go, oh, maybe I should look at you. So I never got the job at Slippery Rock. As a matter of fact, there was a funding issue that year. And the job position that I actually applied for dissolved. So I don't know if I ever would have gotten that job anyway. The job didn't exist. They didn't call me for like a month and then the dean called me and said, sorry, there's no position. But by that time I had already called up the chair of the biology department at Grove City and sent her it was actually an email and I sent her my resume and she said, yeah, we're exactly looking for someone. She was teaching anatomy and physiology and she was pregnant and they needed someone to fill in. That was 2010. I've been there ever since. So that's how a veterinarian gets hired as a professor of biology. So my research interests are in public health and One Health. Do you guys know what One Health means? So One Health means that diseases of animals, diseases of human beings, and issues in the environment are all connected. I teach a course in infectious disease. And part of those diseases are zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that are animal and human diseases that we share. 70 to 75% of all emerging diseases are zoonotic diseases. So people kind of put animal diseases in this category and human diseases in this category. That's not true at all. What affects us and what affects our animals, what affects our environment, is all one health. You can Google one health. You'll get a bunch. You'll get a bunch. I didn't invent it. So I'm very interested in infectious disease. And I started doing some research on ticks. They're not good. And we did some research in Pennsylvania. We worked with some amazing people. 
Game Commission, Department of Animal Health, and they were doing something called CWD testing. You guys know what CWD is? Chronic wasting disease. So chronic wasting disease in Pennsylvania, they were looking for it. This was back in 2013. They were looking for chronic wasting disease in our deer, set up these deer check stations where they were testing the deer that were hunter harvested for this disease. And they found it, by the way, we have it. But what I asked them to do, because they had the deer and they had the deer heads, and deer heads are usually covered with ticks, I sent them tick collection kits. And we piggybacked their study. And they sent me ticks that they collected off of these deer heads that happened to be regional throughout Pennsylvania. Brought them back to our lab and we tested them for five different tick diseases. Which, by the way, there's Lyme disease, but there's a lot of other diseases that are impaired by the ticks. And we found them. We found all of these diseases. We tested for mesiosis, anaplasmosis, and another type of Borrelia. Lyme disease is Borrelia burgdorferi. There's also a Borrelia myomotoi. And we also found Powassan virus. Powassan virus is a very nasty virus. It's tick And it kills you. It makes Lyme disease look like a cold. Okay? Our kids, my kids, my students, we found the first tick born, or at least evidence, that the Powassan virus was a tick, which is a huge deal. And how we did that is when we collected these ticks from all of these deer, we ended up with 3,000 ticks. The diseases we tested for were Lyme disease, which is Borrelia burgdorferi, and then also Borrelia myomotoi. And we just tested for anaplasma species. We tested for Babesia, and there's published studies. There was another one, if I remember it. When we first tested these 3,000 ticks, we found evidence of all these tick-borne diseases throughout Pennsylvania. It was the first study, really, of its kind. Pennsylvania now has a tick task force, which I sit on. So the state of Pennsylvania actually benefited from our study at our little college. So when we had these 3,000 ticks, I was about ready to throw them away. And I have some buddies in the health department. They have some buddies in CDC, and the CDC called us up and said, can we have your ticks? I said, yeah, sure. They said, we want to test them for Powassan virus. So they did. They found it. So we found Powassan virus for the first time in Pennsylvania. And that's a human-born disease, period. So it doesn't affect you. It's a big deal. It's not a very nice disease. I could talk to you guys about this all day. But I need to like do the rest of the talk. I don't get too far off on ticks. I'm really here for honeybees. Which is funny now because I actually gave a tick talk to beekeepers the other day. Because beekeepers are out in the field. Yeah, I, yeah, tick talk. Um, because you need to be aware of these diseases if you're out crawling around in the grass, right? Yeah. So it's interesting how these things get related. But that was my first kind of big research. And we ended up publishing a study with the CDC, which is Little Grove City College. Yeah. And I don't even have a PhD. So. I kind of sort of knew what I was doing, but not really. And then that study kind of wrapped up. We, we collected ticks for three years, then kind of wrapped up, published, said amen. And I didn't really have the research. So in, in, in late 2016, the FDA mandate came out. And most of you probably know what this means. It was a thing that kind of threw beekeepers and veterinarians together. The FDA came out and said, no more over-the-counter antibiotics for beekeepers. So you have to have a veterinary prescription or a veterinary feed directive to get antibiotics. And the whole idea behind this, this is where the now what question comes. The whole idea was, let's prevent antibiotic resistance. Because antibiotic resistance is a huge public health issue in the world. Most public health officials, if they're honest, will tell you that antibiotic resistance is a bigger deal than COVID. But it, you know, maybe it's not a sexy topic, so it doesn't make all the news. I don't know. You know, it was a good idea to try to battle out, you know, reduce antibiotic resistance because beekeepers were and still are dumping antibiotics on their bees. But it took two industries and threw them together and said, go. And it kind of 
you know, made the beekeepers mad because they've been doing it everything on their own, fine. Maybe made some of the apiarists mad because now they're like, we can't do anything, right? And the veterinarians were like, bees? Huh? It was very like, you know, there was no plan to implement this. So it took two industries and threw them together and it was a very uncomfortable relationship. But me, being a veterinarian and being an academic and looking for something to do, I was like, wow, this is a really interesting question. Interesting problem. Actually, when I read the first article, it was in late 2016, I literally laughed out loud. When I was like, Bees, what else are they going to have us do? Oh my gosh. But the more I read about it, the more I thought about it, and I realized that bees were animals, which is still a concept, by the way, that bees are animals and they get diseases, infectious diseases. Bacterial diseases, viral diseases, parasitic diseases, fungal diseases, and you can do diagnostic tests on them. And you can develop a treatment plan for them. That sounds like what I learned about in veterinary school. So, because I'm an academic and a clinician, I can actually look into this. So, I started looking around and I discovered some connections that I didn't realize were there. Anybody ever do that? Like you start asking questions and you're like, wow, this has kind of been set up for a while. I just didn't realize it. There's a place in Ants, France called Oniris. It is a college of engineering and veterinary medicine in France. And it just so happened that our college had a relationship with Oniris and they took students to France twice a year. I had already been there and visited because I was like the vet on campus. So I had gone over and went to France once. And so I knew they were there. What I didn't realize is that Oni Reese also had a bee vet program. Because in France, veterinarians being involved in bees is not a new thing. All of their veterinarians go through rotations Cats, dogs, cows, hogs, chickens, bees. It was normal. Bees were an agricultural animal, just like anything else in much of Europe. Hmm. Wow. And I already know these people. And going to France is really fun. So I've been to France twice and stayed there and lived there for a little while. I also realized that there was a connection that I didn't know that I had, but I had. Montana. One of my projects has been to go out to the Crow Indian Reservation in Montana and do public health service for them. They are the Crow Indians, and that's what the white guys call them. They're actually the Atalike tribe. Every Native American community is different. So I know a little bit about Crow Indians, but I don't know a whole lot about Cherokee. We tend to lump Native Americans into like this one group. They are very diverse. They all have different opinions and thoughts. They don't all get along either. It's an interesting perspective. So I've spent about 10 years taking students out to the Crow Indian Reservation and doing public health service for them and their animals. This is actually me. I usually don't dress like this. This is me and my coveralls. We did clinics for them. We did rabies clinics for their horses. And there are big horse people out there. And uh, for their dogs, or canines. So different gardening projects and such. But what's that connection? Well, in Montana, there's a lot of big beekeepers. Like 10,000 hive beekeepers. That's even a smaller operation. So they put a lot of their bees on the reservations where there's lots of clover springtime and I got to meet a lot of them while I was out there so I put together a sabbatical I researched the field and this is one thing I tell my students and I tell people that I talk to I'm like you know everybody wants to get into bees I've heard that a little bit here. Like this explosion of bees all these new beekeepers I kind of really caution people on that because it need to know what you're doing before you get into it. And I read everything I could 
for three or four years at a research level before and I got bees myself. And we did research and I brought some students into it. So I applied for a sabbatical in fall of 2017. And this is a process. Anybody that's in academia knows this doesn't happen overnight. You gotta do all the paperwork and everything. So I was actually granted it in the spring and ended up going on sabbatical in the spring of 2018. And essentially what that was was an eight month version in the beekeeping industry for me. I went over to Europe. I was out in Montana. I spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia. I logged over a thousand hours in the field with beekeepers. And I did a lot of listening to a lot of people in the industry, both in academia, out in the field, different types of beekeepers. So I had a couple goals when I started out. Here they are. And one was to investigate this, right? This whole field. And I certainly did that. But this was really meant for my own personal, professional development, right? I was due for a sabbatical. Yay, I get to travel. This is fun. Cool. Got to go around the world a little bit. And I wanted to go to France. And I definitely wanted to go out to Montana. I wanted to work in the field with local beekeepers. That local being Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia. And ultimately, I wanted to bring a research apiary back, just a small one, a couple hives, back to the college, so that I could play with bees with students. That was my goals. What happened? Well, I went to France. I forgot about that part. Anyway, so glad you liked it. So, yeah, I went to Oniris, and I hung out with some of their experts, and they have like this kind of post doc or post veterinary bee program there. And I, you know, you guys are talking about your mentors. You can't really see her here, but she's on there. That's Monique, Monique Ohostis. She was the founder of this program at Oni Reese. One of her mentors wrote Honeybee Veterinary Medicine, Nicholas. So she hung out with me and told me everything she did. And I learned a little bit of French while I was there. And one thing I can say is the French people are wonderful in that if you learn a little bit of their language or you try to learn their language, they really help you out. Even if you speak bad French, right? You know, they really encourage you to continue to speak. Not, not all countries are like that, but France really likes their language and likes people that try to speak it. And it was funny because Monique and I, she took me all over the of the place in France. She didn't speak great English and I didn't speak great French, but we had this kind of English French thing that we were doing, you know, and communicating. And we were on a train going into town. And there was a guy that was sitting across from us and looking at us, smiling. And finally he was like, What language are you speaking? France and in a lot of European countries, these are just part of the veterinary school education. You know, and that's typically, you know, learn about bees. They do more honey testing. Kim was talking about this. They're a little bit more than monitoring their honey. Antibiotics are banned. You can't even get a prescription. It's not even a thing. Okay. And they're also very concerned. It's not that we aren't concerned, but they're very concerned about pesticides and don't use a lot. France also has a more temperate climate. Even though it's more to the north, like the latitude is more than here because of the Gulf Stream and all of the oceans that are there, it's a more temperate climate. So their beekeeping is a little bit different. I went there in January and there was flowers blowing. They don't also have a lot of migratory beekeeping. So that changes things a bit as well. So I have some pictures here. Sorry, I did a collage because I didn't want to have 87 slides or anything like that. Here's some flowers. That, I mean, this was January, and there were just flowers blooming all over the place. And I actually got to go to the OIE. The OIE is like the World Health Organization for Animals in, in Paris. Uh, and they took me in and kind of showed me the, the conference room where all of the animal disease things talk about. I did get to go to some larger beekeepers. Uh, this is Family Mary, which is a big company and, and beekeeping beekeeper. 
France. So I, I kind of went all over France and they were so nice to me and they showed me their entire industry. Then, because of the group that I piggyback with, the group that I went with wasn't just going to France. They also happened to be going to Scotland. That was not part of my plan, but they were like, do you also want to go to Scotland? I was like, yes, yes I do. And it turns out they have bees in Scotland too. So I made arrangements, started making some calls. And this is the thing, I'm just like this person calling up people and asking for help. And a lot of people will help you, you do. So I went to the University of Edinburgh, or if you're from Scotland, it's the University of Edinburgh, okay? And they have the Rosslyn Institute there, which is famous for cloning the first animal. So, and this is Edinburgh Castle. So if you can go there, it's, it's a neat place to go. But as far as their beekeeping goes, um, they are this island country. And yes, Scotland is part of the UK, but they don't like to think of themselves that way. And they kind of are in their own little world there. So their beekeeping community is smaller, it's easier to control, everybody knows everybody else. Like this is the whole country, right? You know, and most states have a lot more than this, right? And they all belong to one organization. Imagine that, one big bee club. And most of them are backyard. There's only a couple commercial operations in the whole country. They have a national honeybee strategy plan, national plan, beyond what England has, by the way, which is different. Um, so just kind of a different strategy of how to do things. You can manage things differently depending on what your operation looks like, right? I mean, how you approach backyard beekeeping versus commercial beekeeping, it's completely different. And it's very different country to country, too. Different things may work for different situations. So in Scotland, they also have to have a script for any type of prescription. So here's some pictures. This was the Scottish beekeeper that took me back. Because at the University of Edinburgh, they also have the vet school, and the vet school has an apiary. So he took me to their apiary and showed me up. And you had to walk through the sheep field, though, to get to the apiary. So. This might have been some of Dolly's offspring, I'm not really sure. And they had these hives there that looked like this. This is like an English hive kind of thing, but you don't dare call it an English hive. In Scotland, you call it a Scottish hive. Completely different, right? And they had these straps over the hives and they were locked down. You notice it was fenced in. You know, and as a Pennsylvania person, I'm thinking, do they have bears in Scotland? Well, they don't. So I actually asked the beekeeper, I'm like, why do you have fencing and you have you know, straps that are locking your hives down? And he says, oh, we don't have bears, but we do have other beekeepers. So different problems in different places. Oh, and here's my funny slide. This is me. Between the queen house, or the, the castle, there's, you know, God rest the queen, right? She actually had a residence. And there was this kind of a miracle mile in between that you could go up and look at all kinds of fun shops and things. So this is me in one of those shops. And by the way, anybody know what Outlander is? Okay. Oh, yeah, it's Jamie. And you know what? In Scotland, they embrace it. Jamie's everywhere. They're like, yep. And I don't want to ruin the story, but if you want to read a good book series, Outlander has like, I don't know, nine books or something now. But yeah, he's the Scottish Highlander. Oh, yeah. And it's also in a series right now. And whoever they cast, when he walked into the casting for this, they probably were like, yes, this man, he is the guy. He is the guy that's in the book. And guys, by the way, too, the heroine of all of the series is worth it, too. So there's a little bit for the men, right? Yeah, yeah. So in Montana, I worked commercial beekeepers, 10,000 hive migratory beekeepers. And they would actually fly around. They had so many hives, and I got to go up in the plains with these guys, see their yard. They had these little bush planes that could like land in this room, you know, and take off by the time we got to the parking lot over there. Pretty cool. They do things different out there. They have one honey flow. They don't have spring and fall, because, you know, Montana. They have clover, and that's it. 
and then they moved their hives somewhere else in the winter. And it was interesting to learn from them and work with. This is Nick. This is one of the beekeepers I work with. He's a tall guy, okay, and he's standing in the clover there in July. And if I was standing here, you wouldn't see me, okay. But you know what I learned with these beekeepers, and I heard some other women, you know, little women. Yep, I'm like five one on a good day. But when you come out, again, I'm a farm girl, you know, you show them you can lift up a bee box and start moving things around. They're like, hey, you're hired. But yeah, we got to work for it. They also had a helicopter. So I got to fly around in a helicopter. It was just really cool. You know, and how they would manage their bees is, you know, they wouldn't go in and necessarily do inspections or anything. They'd pop the top, they see white wax. They're like, and you're good. Next hive. Full disclosure, I work for a college that doesn't accept any state or federal funding, which is a really interesting place to work. I don't have to do research. My college is a teacher. I do research for fun. And not to discredit those of you that have like $100,000, million dollar grants, that's a lot of work. But I don't really have to do that. I don't have that requirement. So that lets me be free on a lot of things. We can accept grants that are private, and we do, but I don't have to follow a lot of rules. I can also say, well, I am totally enriched by all of the money that my college gives me for doing research. They give us stipends of a couple hundred dollars a year <laughs> to do the research that I do. And I don't say that to be like, oh, I'm great, and you know, it's a big charity person. But when it comes to following the money, you know, they, they follow the money. Do you want to see where my motivations are? Do you want to follow the money on me? Like my purse is under the table there, and there's probably like 10 bucks in it, okay? But it, it gives me a lot of freedom to do and say what I want. We started to get donations that allowed us to build our apiary garden. But it was also a lot of work. I recently had a colleague of mine ask me, how did you get the apiary started on the campus? And I said, well, got a shovel. And I started digging. And you know who built the apiary? And we had a, a scrub area and we cleared it out. A couple of things started happening. The Department of Agriculture, there's veterinarians there. They started saying, hey, we don't know anything about vets and bees. Do you know something about vets and bees? Help us. So I started consulting with them. I started again going to conferences, but I also started getting asked to do conferences. Since 2019, I've done, I just counted them last night, I've done 25 different conferences, even with COVID. And I started developing talks. So people asked me to do so. So I have a wide variety of talks that I can give. And I've been talking to beekeeping groups, but I'm also talking to veterinarians, educating veterinarians on bees. I went to Appamundia, Montreal, 2019. Apiary got put in place, which that's a long story in itself. And we developed a website. If you want to know more about what we're doing, you can check this out. It's all the research that we're doing. It's education that we're doing, which we're largely educational. It's sources for veterinarians, sources for beekeepers. In 2020, I joined the Honeybee Veterinary Consortium, and I'm on the board there. That is a group of veterinarians that are interested in educating veterinarians about bees and reaching out to them. So I am on the board of that. And then, also in 2020, I was being interviewed by Jay Evan. And suddenly this guy appears. And this was over Zoom, right? It was 2020. This guy appears, and it's Jerry. And he asked me, I don't even know how he creeped on me to find out that I was talking to Jay Evan. But he did. And he asked me to start writing for him, like right there. I'd never met him before. I was like, who's this dude? Right? I was like, okay. And I wrote my first article, and I didn't even know if he was going to accept it. I was like, okay, I wrote something. And he accepted it, and I was like, oh, good. And that was like two and a half years ago, and I've written an article almost every month since then in agriculture. So apparently I had something to say. Thank you. And people started asking me to write other things. Like I wrote biosecurity protocols for veterinarians going into bee homes. You can make that available to anybody. I was asked to write some chapters and some veterinary textbooks on animals. So they're being 
thing. And yeah, four conferences. So like twenty five different meetings. So you know, with all of that examining and diagnosing the problem, I think I kinda know what's going on between veterinarians, beekeeping. Okay. What's the point of all this? How can this be a good thing? Well, first of all, it has to be more than just two diseases and three drugs. I mean, literally, we were called into it to write prescriptions or VFDs for three drugs, American Fabro and European Fabro. Imagine if you went to your doctor and they could only treat you for two diseases with three drugs. It's ridiculous. There is no other animal that we would be like, oh, I can only talk about you know, two, three drugs and two diseases. And by the way, as scary as American fowl brood is, the prevalence, incidence of it is quite small. I know in Pennsylvania, I just looked it up for 2021, there were three cases in the entire state. Three cases in the entire state, and there's like 61,000 colonies. You do the math on that, it's like 0. 0.00 into the thousandth place percentage of incidents. Now I know every state's probably different. But I mean, the true threat of it, of this endemic disease that's in the dirt, is pretty low. And antibiotics don't do a darn thing anyway. Spores, read about it. But there's a lot of other diseases that affect bees that are a big deal. I'm not saying American fowl brood isn't a big deal. It can be. If you burn your hive, that's a big deal for you. But the overall industry and instance of diseases and issues, Varroa, the viruses, Nosema, you guys need help. So what's happening now? What are we doing? What am I involved in? I didn't want to get involved with my first four little goals, but people are asking me, and I have the ability and the time to hear it. We're doing training in the veterinary schools. There are six schools that I know of that now have B clubs, veterinary schools, and there's only 30 veterinary schools in the U.S., so actually that's a pretty big percentage. We're adding more chapters. They are adding B curriculum into the U.S. schools. Almost every veterinary conference, and veterinarians have to get continuing education every two years to maintain their license. Almost every continuing education conference for veterinarians now contains BCE. And the Honeybee Veterinary Consortium, we are working on a certification process for veterinarians that are interested in bees. And what that means is they have to complete several hundred hours that we're designing through our program, which is based on some other programs, like there's a fish medicine program certification. This gives you some level of certification and mentorship that you can say, I have been out in bee yards, I have done this much continuing education. It's not the first time I'm looking in a bee box as a veterinarian. So that program is probably going to start next year. So if we have veterinarians that are interested in getting certified, if they have the certification, beekeepers can at least say, okay, at least they have looked in a hive before. It's at least several hundred hours of education on bees. So we're working. I think the other thing that can be done locally, you know, veterinary associations have local clubs, local associations just like beekeepers do. And a lot of times they mirror each other, at least it does in my state. I'm sure it's play like that in a lot of other states. And these guys are reaching out to me. And we're connecting. I just, last week I did a talk for the Northwestern Pennsylvania Veterinary Association. And there's also a Northwestern Pennsylvania Beekeeping Association. So we kind of work together on this. So these local relationships, I think that can be reaching. It doesn't have to be every vet. I, I get this complaint. I can't find a veterinarian who knows anything about bees. Well, I'm sorry, I'm working on it. But you know what? It doesn't have to be every veterinarian. And not every veterinarian has to know about bees. 
if you get a couple in your state, you're going to be good. And I can tell you the veterinarians that are interested in this are really interested. So the veterinarians that are that are interested in it aren't, they know they're not going to like make a million dollars. Certainly. Data sharing is another thing that I think we can work on. It's, it's amazing to me how much data is not there in some bee diseases. It's almost a travesty. Like in veterinary medicine, I get reports all the time on incidents of different animal diseases. I can tell you by county how many cases of rabies there are, at least reported cases. So that's another topic for another day. But like, why don't we know, why don't we have good data, at least good national data on American Cobra? It's a really spotty hard. Why don't we? And why isn't it shared? Why is it like the secret thing? I understand that there's a stigma there, but oh my gosh, we need to know this so we can address it properly. Veterinarians are really good at that kind of stuff. I think, you know, government, there's a lot we can do, and I'm so happy, and I've reached out to just about every apiarist that's here, been like, please tell me what you think. Because, you know, in Pennsylvania, and I know every state's different, so that makes it difficult, but in Pennsylvania, bees are under the plant bureau. All other animals are under the animal health, and veterinarians are there, and your apiarists are in your plant bureau. I was in a meeting once with the state and people from the veterinary side and people from the plant side. And I said, well, you know, bees are animals. And you would have thought I said something wrong, you know? And I just thought that was a, you know, I am a biologist. I thought that was right. But, you know, for some political reason, that was the wrong thing to say. But, and Jerry and I have had this talk before. Bees are one of the most important agricultural animals we yeah. have. Why aren't they animals? And the USDA considers them to be animals. But if you guys want to get more funding and more, you know, importance, they should be animals. Because they are. And they deserve the same respect, the same funding, the same attention that cows, chickens, and hogs, and everything else gets. I could talk about that for a long time. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we really could improve this. I mean, the, the steps are already there if people just kind of link hands and communicate. A little restructuring. So funding, I kind of talked to you about that already. No, I think, I think overall the bee industry should be able to tap into more agricultural funding if they're recognized that. All right, so here's some of my girls. And by the way, you know, interestingly enough, most of my research students are women. Guys can apply, but I find myself mentoring a lot of young women in beekeeping. So here we are. Well, this is my original group, and we're still building. Oops, we are still building a beekeeping. Thank you, guys.